Um, as we talk about the future of financial technologies, um, key topics such as safe and secure access to crypto offerings, the adoption of DLT technology in banking, and balancing privacy with compliance have become increasingly important. Successful blockchain integrations and the impact of AI in finance are reshaping the industry. While future trends are at the intersection of traditional finance and new technologies continue to emerge. In our next conversation, we will explore these critical issues, highlighting the innovation and collaboration, driving the next wave of financial advancements. Please welcome Christian Drau and Hakim Raya. Yeah. Gentlemen. Warm welcome, Hakim, Thanks to so Blockchain much. Days. Yeah, warm welcome. Please. Uh, yeah, okay. yeah, you're welcome. You're invited. <laughs> yeah. Please have a seat, uh, gentlemen. <clears throat> now, let's uh, start with a short introduction. Uh, Christian, you're working for MasterCards. That's true. Traditional financial. That's true. Yeah, but working on crypto and other. Also true. Yeah, maybe you can. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, so my name is Christian. Um, I'm indeed working for MasterCard. I was socialized in our core business. So I spent 10 years in, in various BD product and general management roles. And then some three years back, I transitioned into uh, what we call crypto or blockchain go to market for Europe. And uh, why do we do that? Uh, we believe that the sort of the promise of Bitcoin and, and, and blockchain and this whole conundrum uh, is, is indeed very compelling. Um, but of course, if you're in payment, if you're in asset management, if you're in banking, it's also a bit scary. So you definitely want to see uh, the innovative potential of the technology being unfolded, but you want to make sure it doesn't sideline your existing business. And that's why we engage in this space very actively. Wonderful. Hakim. Yeah, hi, uh, thank you for having me here and thank you guys. Uh, yeah, so I'm Hakim, uh, I'm the founder of Blank Labs based here in our very own Amsterdam. Uh, my background has been, yeah, technology for as long as I can remember. Uh, engineer by training, I've worked in different sectors but primarily building stuff, so uh, computer architecture, consumer electronics, medical devices. Most recently, before I got into the whole uh, entrepreneurship journey, uh, I was building low-power radar-based uh, gesture sensors at Google in Mountain View, and then just decided I wanted to change. I wanted to move to the other side of the pond, start building something on my own, and uh, yeah, after a few different experiments with some personal uh, you know, foray into the crypto space, realized a lot of the user experience part was broken and uh, yeah with my background in engineering i thought we could address a few of those and so that's been the attempt uh, so far at blank labs where our idea is to actually uh, bring a service which is pretty mainstream that users already understand which is banking and how do you decentralize that and yeah we'll get into a little bit more of like what do i mean about decentralization when I say decentralized banking. Uh, yeah. Decentralized banking, yeah, because giving this potential of uh, blockchain technologies in, in banking and payments, I mean, you've been working on this already for, for a couple of years. What are the key preconditions that need to be met before this widespread adoption? I think from our perspective, and we would always like to call ourselves the adult in the room, not, not looking at other people who don't do that. But um, if, if you do this at scale as we do already, like uh, three billion cards and nine trillion in volume, for us, it is uh, the same standards apply as they would apply to any other core business that we do around the world. So that means compliance is key, you know, KYC, AML, all these things that yep. sometimes are a bit more, you know, hard to relate to for, uh, let's say, crypto native people, but we are very much bound by this. And um, then I think consumer protection is very important. Also have a strong view on that one. Um, and then reliability and scale, obviously, um, because yeah, for us, it's all about global interoperability. And again, it's, it would be 3 billion cards at 100 
plus million acceptance location. And um, this is how we look at it. Of course, not everything needs to work um, you know, uh, at global scale at once. So we do local pilots and things. This is totally OK. But at the end of the day, this is the perspective that we have. And it, it will be about, yeah. Um, compliance, consumer protection, scalability, security, uh, reliability. What do you think, uh, Hakim? Yeah, I think I uh, echo a bunch of things that uh, Christian mentioned, and I do completely uh, agree with him uh, when he says that you know Mastercard is the adult in the room because you know uh, when we are building decentralized technology, a lot of us are purely technologists and. We have this view of techno I mean, scalability as just, OK, transactions per second. But there is more to scalability than just transactions per second, right? Because we need to understand like, how it applies to s transactions of different scale, right? How efficiently a blockchain transaction works for a 5 euro coffee transaction, compare that to a 5 million house purchase, right? It needs to be as efficient both ways. So the couple things that come to mind immediately. One is uh, fee model. I would like to see basically an evolution of fee model where the fee model is as uh, efficient for small transactions and large transactions. Uh, obviously, there's a metric of what's the quality of service, the, there being a minimum guarantee of quality of service for every transaction, and then there being an accelerated channel for uh, for possibly users who do want to prioritize their transaction, right? So a fee model that evolves uh, to understand different uh, parameters of transaction execution, that's one. The other thing that I do think that we need to learn from TradFi is the importance of privacy preservation, right? So that's really important when we do transaction. We can't have a system where you, know, you do a transaction and then basically somebody can just look up your entire history and then based on that, I mean, maybe that service is useful for you or it isn't, but the user needs to be in charge of uh, you know, handing over that privacy data of their own uh, usage pattern and their own balances and all that stuff to service providers and other players in the market. So I would say basically these two aspects of uh, making the fee model work for everyone, mm -hmm. so that's bringing true inclusivity into the picture, and then also uh, making sure that Privacy of the user is is uh, given utmost importance. It's a fee model, privacy. Um, can you maybe name some uh, current limitations of the blockchain technology that really needs to be addressed to achieve real user adoption? You want to have a go, or shall? Oh, please. please. I mean, w what we see, and again, I'm 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 not a technical enough person to debate, you know, the, the capacity of different layer ones and layer twos and whatnot. Yeah. But for us, again, it, it gets to the point that you need to be able to process these transactions at scale. And again, um, we're processing, give or take nine trillion of global transactions. So that's, that's a lot. Then another thing is if only 0.01 of these transactions need to be reversed. And I'm not, you know, you buy something in an online shop. They then send you the stuff, but the shoes are too big, the shirt is too small, whatever it is. You need to reverse the transaction, right? Um, and again, if it's only a small fraction of these reversals, and again, it's not something inherently bad if these things happen, right? It's, it's uh, part of the business. You need to be able to also uh, process uh, this. Then costs are obviously um, an important uh, component, and the speed of transaction. If you go to a, let's say, a food discounter like Aldi, Lidl, or whatever name you choose, right? People get anxious if they wait too long in the queue, and and the, the you know these retailers they measure the checkout time at the till, right? They know exactly that a contactless card is quite likely faster than, you know, I'm stereotyping here, an old lady looking for the exact amount in cash to pay 16 euro 38 um, in, in, in euro, right? Um, so that's also an important component because nowadays, you know, it's all highly standardized. You take out your, your uh, smartphone, you tap it, you use your Apple Watch, whatever. Um, so there's multiple components as to scalability um, and, and, and basically 
uh, concurrent transaction are one component, but I wouldn't want to narrow down the discussion to only the layer one capabilities. There's more to it. Yeah. I see you nodding like I also would like to respond to that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I'd love to add. Um, so uh, one of the other things that I think uh, would be, so OK, let's step back and see basically what we're talking about when we say decentralized payments, right? What do we want to decentralize at this point, right? So one is that the trust needs to be decentralized. That's really important, right? Because you don't need to trust, or you shouldn't need to trust uh, one player or a handful of players to say that they're the, uh, you know, the, the keepers of the sanctity of the network or, or the protocol, right? So it, that needs to be decentralized. The ownership, right, that needs to be decentralized. So the user actually owns the asset. And then lastly, it's basically service, right? So the service needs to be provided by an open community, right? So that's what this decentralized part in the decentralized ecosystem brings in, right? So when we say this, how would a service work when you don't actually have a central authority saying that, OK, here's a person, here's the identity of the person, and they're allowed to do transaction in a certain geography? So what I mean by that is, how do we take care of identity management, which would be absolutely important from KYC AML requirements, that how do we make sure that the identity requirements are fulfilled, but at the same time do that in a privacy conscious way, right? So that would be an important way, uh, for uh, an important thing for technology to handle so that we can actually make decentralized payments a reality. So by that I mean that you could transact with any service provider. The service provider has the capability of verifying that this is an entity we can offer service to based on the laws of a particular region. But at the same time, the user doesn't have to disclose all the privacy details of their identity to that service provider in order to enable that. Right? So that, that would be, how do you do decentralized identity management? That would be one key aspect of making um, you know, decentralized payments at large a reality, I would say. Now, now, speaking of privacy, um, how might the integration of blockchain technology with traditional payment systems enhance the transaction transparency and security? And are there also potential uh, downsides to increase transparency? What do you think, uh, Christian? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so for, for us, data privacy is, is obviously super important. We made European GDPR, <laughs> which you know, by my understanding, is sort of the gold standard around the world. We made that also our global standard when it comes to uh, data handling, because people, you know, for right reasons, uh, is assume that you know, if they use their card for a certain transaction, uh, not everybody knows what they're doing, and we don't know personal data, so we wouldn't know that Jan is do using his card, uh, you know, to make a certain transaction. We know just these 16-digit PAN uh, numbers. And obviously, this level of uh, privacy needs to be maintained um, in whatever technical sort of setup uh, we conduct uh, transactions. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's uh, many uh, interesting and upcoming uh, technologies which, uh, which will make that a reality, right? I mean, if you actually step back and think about what was the uh, reason why we had the transparency and hence the anonymity requirement, right? I mean, when Bitcoin developed, we didn't have a bunch of technologies that could do this, uh, decentralized consensus while, not, uh, while that not being completely transparent to the system. By transparency, what you want is the rules of the game is transparent. You don't need transparency of who's paying whom what, right? That's not the transparency that you need to guarantee that the protocol is fair and it's playing by the same rules, right? That was just a, a side effect of the fact that the decentralized protocol that Bitcoin was able to adopt then only could work when you had the entire transaction transparent, including the payment, uh, the sender and receiver. So the repercussion of that was that you wanted anonymity, that you wanted to say that, okay, Sure, it's completely transparent, but as long as you don't know who the identity of the sender is, then you're fine, right? So that 
took us to this, down this path where we say that, okay, anonymity is really what we want. But if you talk to users, really, many consumer surveys have found this, that users are actually fine sharing their data as long as they have control over who they share what data with, and they have the ability to revoke that access when they don't want uh, that service provider anymore and switch to a different service provider. So privacy, I think, is is a more important metric than anonymity at, at, at that. And then when you talk about privacy, then you have the considerations that we just discussed of saying that how do you make sure different parties are accessing the information that they need to just perform their role, right? So user has the identity, the attestation authority, which is, say, the government or any other identity provider, is the one that is able to attest to the fact that, yes, this uh, identity is authentic, and the service provider just needs to be able to verify that this identity complies to the rules that we have put in as the rules of the protocol, right? So zero-knowledge protocols over here, for instance, are immensely powerful, and I see that decentralized identity using uh, ZK uh, would, would essentially be the future of how you can essentially comply to the rules while at the same time not have to uh, compromise privacy of the users um, to providers that don't need to get that information. Now, there's questions coming in from the audience. Um, it reminds me of an experiment of a Dutch uh, bank <clears throat> who was experimenting with uh, DeFi and also uh, published a paper about that. And they were like, nah, for now, you know, it's not of interest for us. The question that we got from the audience is like, will traditional banks fail if they don't adapt blockchain technology? Will, will they fail? Uh, <laughs> I think, you know, the, 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 I don't want to narrow it down to will they fail or not. I think obviously new technology changes the game in banking. And that's not only happening now, right? I'm old enough to, to remember that back in the days you would go into, into a sort of a physical bank to withdraw your cash, right? And then it was ATMs to get your cash. And then it was uh, the first direct banks. It was ING in Germany, where I'm from, you know, didn't have a retail outlet. Um, but it changed the game for those banks that do have uh, retail outlets, right? And then some 13 years back or whatever, we had the first wave of mobile first challenger banks like uh, Number 26, Revolut, Bunk from, from, from the Netherlands. So there is a long track record of technology changing the competitive landscape for banks. I think there's a long track record of technology also solving a bit for the information asymmetry between banks and consumers, right? If, if you look at what kind of fees you are paying 15 years back today, you know, if you want to wire transfer money, um, you use a multi-currency wallet, you use WISE. So I think technology has, I don't want to say, uh, you know, made away with banks because we all know banks are there, but I think forces banks in a very constructive way to up their game and get better. And I do believe some of the things will will continue to change. Um, if you're today, if you were in, uh, I don't know, Ecuador, and I was in Ethiopia, and you wanted to send me 100,000 euros or US dollars, the money would go from Ecuador to, to the US, to, to Germany, to Dubai, and then to Ethiopia, would be three, four banks touching the money. <laughs> um, and it would cost anything between five and 15% and take three, four days, right? Yeah. Uh, if we're now looking at both of us having a stable coin wallet, and you know, um, we, we do that um, on Ethereum or whatever, it would cost 12 euros and would be done in five minutes. And um, I think banks will need to constantly uh, evolve themselves. And I think they have a good track record in doing so, right? There's lots of banks jumping on the bandwagon. Um, so I don't think um, doing nothing is an option. So um, I, don't, I don't think to answer the question, um, we will get to the point that banks say, no, nah, we don't want to do that, we'd rather die. That's not how it's going to happen here, right? Yeah. Uh, it's going to be they adopt the technology in bits and parts of their business where they see fit, where they see it compatible with their values, their standards, you know, scalability, compliance, and, and so on and so forth. Um, 
and put it to use. And I mean, the the the, the examples are 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 uh, abundant, right? Yep. If you look at it's, it's not a bank technically, but if you look what BlackRock was doing with the Bitcoin ETF and how they sucked in assets on the management in this. Um, I mean, big example, if you look like JP Morgan and others doing Onyx and their coins, example, PayPal uh, doing a stable coin, also not a bank, but you know what you would uh, summarize under TradFi. So I think there's, there's already a lot of this happening as we speak. Now, we only have 25 minutes for today, so unfortunately, I already have to close down oh. the conversation. Maybe with one more last topic. Um, what future trends are emerging on the intersection uh, between I traditional finance and blockchain technologies? Can you one, like, maybe share one exciting trend that you're looking forward to in the upcoming months or years? Hakim. Yeah, sure. Um, I would say basically uh, for widespread, I mean, uh, we really care about getting it to mainstream users. And mainstream users are not the ones that are traders, right? So they are the ones who are going to see some real value in actually dealing with the technology. They're not coming for fascination of technology. So from that perspective, we think that uh, tokenization of real world assets, starting with treasuries, which we already see has happened, is going to be an important game because real world assets really are something that have matured over the years and they bring real value to the users. That's why we call them real world assets. And uh, yeah, I mean, they're uh, already pretty uh, good uh, models that are built around that and a lot of interesting, I mean, this is one of those examples that you were mentioning of TradFi players adopting technology and uh, you see the largest of the uh, US institutional uh, players playing this game of tokenizing assets because they know that it can actually bring value to, to retail consumers. So yeah, I would say, Real world assets. Christian, uh, being, being the boring TradFi person, I, I'm most excited about regulation. Um, <laughs> but on, <laughs> but, on, on, uh, but on, on a serious note, I think Mika, um, you know, um, in, in Europe taking effect in its first part, uh, end of this month actually, and then uh, 1st of Jan 2025, really puts a framework out there that's, let's, you know, let me stereotype again, that a 60-year-old Dutch lady, you know, could, could put her lifetime savings uh, in a stable coin and she would be protected by an asset that is regulated, uh, you know, by, by, by European uh, authorities, right? And I think that is exciting to me because mm. it basically uh, acknowledges that blockchain, um, stable coins, all of these things that Mika is looking at is something that uh, the traditional financial system takes serious enough yeah. to, you know, to give them a seat by the adult people table and you need to play by the same rules. And I think if you want to grow from now you have three to 10% global adoption to crypto, but if you want to really go out there and even challenge the big banks, you need to be able to uh, convey to consumers that your money is just as safe as if you left it with the bank. And that's, I think that's exciting if you look at it from, from this point of view. Oh, it's exciting and there's a long way to go. I mean, my mother, for example, she still is scared of using Apple Pay and mobile payments. She's the one that is still mm -hmm. using a lot of cash and cards. Yeah. So, but um, we're on track. Um, thank you so much, Hakim, Christian, for joining thank this uh, conversation. Thank you, Jan. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jan. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much.